Welcome everyone today to our event called Decolonizing the Internet. My name is Yasmin Abdel Majid and I am so excited and honored to be joined by PhD researcher and former editor of Media Diversified, Hena Zamrud Bhut, to discuss the concept of digital colonialism. Today's event is part of the WebRoots Democracy Festival, which is marking the end of the organization after six and a half wonderful years. And thank you to Eric for putting this together and for all your work with WebRoots with Web over the past six and a half years. And if you're following along and wish to tweet about today's discussion, and we do recommend that you do, please use the hashtag WebRootsFest. And if you're following us on Zoom or Facebook Live, please feel free to send questions throughout, and we'll put them to Hannah at the end. So thank you so much, Hannah, for joining. And let's start with like setting out the basic um, foundation for this conversation. What is digital colonialism? Hello. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. And really excited to be chatting to you, Yasmin, and to, to go into my favorite topic, obviously. And thank you, Arik, for asking me as well. Um, yeah, let's kick off with talking about what, what do we mean when we're talking about digital colonialism? Um, I think it helps to think about colonialism as people, are rec uh, people recognize it. So if we think about it in terms of European colonialism um, over history, we can separate it into different aspects. So the way I'm thinking of it is in terms of um, an idea of economic expansion. So again, we recognize that from European colonialism in the past, um, going into new territories and trying to extract resources from them, be that human labor, be that um, natural resources, be that land. Um, and then we can think about it. So that's the first, the economic aspect. And then we think about it in terms of um, the sub subjugation of others. So applying our own categories of race, of religion, um, of gender identities onto the groups that inhabit these spaces. Uh, and then the last aspect is, uh, is an ideology of colonialism. So that is, um, in this case, it's the ideology of the internet. So the idea that an internet exists and the characteristics that we ascribe to that um, entity. Okay, and so if those are the sort of then categories that we think of European colonialism as we understand it, how then does that apply to the internet? Yeah. And I mean, it may it, some of these bits may be obvious to our listeners, but I think it's useful to, to step through it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, totally agree with you. So, I mean, let's kick off with this uh, ideology of the internet, um, which um, impacts my work, I think, quite a lot. And it's something that only, I think, became apparent to me as I did the work, because I went into the work very much focused on the technical side, as a lot of people do when they're going into research about media, about communications. You're interested, you're, I mean, I am the kind of person that's interested by gadgets and in all new technology. So that was what I went in with. Um, but uh, this ideology aspect became more uh, important as I did the research. And I think you have to look back at um, where the internet came from and the idea of the internet came from. And it came from the US and it came from a time when people were very interested in this idea of like the cyber world um, and the, the way that that cyber world operates uh, was, um, it was, it was a libertarian ideology. So it's a space where, you know, free speech is very key. Um, John Perry Barlow has a very famous um, declaration of the independence of cyberspace. Um, and it's a document that was written uh, back in the 70s. And in it, he talks about cyberspace is a home of the mind and we don't need governments here. We don't, your sovereignty doesn't apply to us in this space. Um, so, you know, this is the ideology that informed um, the people who went about creating um, the spaces on the internet that we now use. Um, and other aspects of this ideology, well, it's about, you know, freedom is very important. This idea of openness is very important. That there can be no kind of restrictions on, on our play in this space. Um, and then we also think about what characteristics it needs to have keep, to keep going. Well, it needs to be uh, constantly expanding. There needs to be more and more people joining this network. It, it must include everybody. That's again a characteristic that's been ascribed to this, this ideology of the internet. And when we then, it's interesting when we think about it in terms of now the internet should be serving the public good or whatever and that's, a, that's an expectation we have because so many of us use it. But when we actually uh, apply that, it, 
you have to question whether that really makes sense because was it even created for that purpose in the first place? What purposes was it created for? And also what purposes were the, the various uh, resources that we use online created for as well? Yeah, it's so interesting to hear you kind of name the assumptions or the ideas that informed people who were involved in the creation of what we now know as the internet, because we often don't question them at all, right? We often are like, well, obviously the internet needs to be open. Well, obviously there needs to be no restrictions. Well, obviously this is a playground, but like those things are not obvious. Those things are not necessarily um, a given for everyone or even important for everybody. And so the idea that all of a sudden everybody in the world has to agree to these things being the reason uh, or the, the very foundation, it, it kind of also, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. For me, it triggers all of these ideas of like power and the exertion of power and the idea of that, like my idea of how the world should be, um, should be the most important, should be the supreme. Yeah, absolutely. Um, totally agree with you that power is the thing um, that influences all this. And also another thing, another aspect of the power of this ideology is the fact that it makes itself invisible. So it's very mm. self-evident that the internet should be a certain way, that we should all be online. I mean, it's a completely universally accepted norm. Um, one of the things that kind of, again, drew me into the research was um, internet access became a human right around uh, four, four years ago or something like that. Um, it's a part of the it was a part of the Millennium Development Goals and then even more a part of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and so I was just, you know, I was thinking to myself, why has this become increasingly accepted as just a norm in society that we need to be working towards internet access for everybody? Uh, how did that come about? Who is that benefiting? Uh, what does the access mean within this, within this um, framework? Mm. And and you can also see kind of examples of how this ideology um, falls into other spaces as well. Um, and I think it illustrates it even a bit better. So we think of the idea of the platform, the internet platform. Um, so that's say, say for example, a social network like Facebook, um, that to call it a platform is an ideological device because it suggests firstly that it's just a, a scaffolding uh, upon which other people come and hang their goods they kind of fill it up um, but it's neutral in its structure um, that it is you know it's designed just for everybody to come and use but it in itself holds no value it holds it's completely neutral and that's if it's I think it's clearer when we talk about it in terms of the platform but it's very similar when we talk about it in terms of the internet and also we think about the internet user as well this term user um, someone who uses a service this is how we're thinking about it you know, these are the terms in which a uh, user is, is thought about. This is what it engenders when we describe uh, someone who's using a service. Now, when we are doing so much of our work of living online, we are, we are not users online, we are citizens online. And we should, there should be some degree of accountability to our needs as well, rather than it, us just be considered as a, as a consumer, you know. Um, but using the word citizen, it, it suggests that we should have accountability. And so user is again, an, another ideological term that's deployed similarly to, to back up these ideas. Mm. And, and it's interesting to hear you use the word citizen, because when we think of citizen, we think of state we think of um, some sort of um, nationhood, but of course, like, that's not, uh, that's not necessarily how the internet is organized, right? Part of the idea of the internet, again, is that it's global, that it, it respects, you know, physical or, or imposed borders. So who then are we, like, is the colonialism or the imperialism of the internet one that is controlled by state in your mind or more by private sector? Or how does that kind of how does that happen? So I think when we think about this kind of colonization of the idea of the internet, um, especially through my research, um, what I've noticed is, so what I've been doing is I've been observing conferences which play a very, mm. very important role in internet governance um, because we don't have specific laws generally that apply to the whole internet. So what you need to do according to the UN is bring the different stakeholders that are involved, be that mm. public sector, private sector, into conversation with one another. So I've been observing these conferences and, and the, you can really see these ideas kind of go up against each other in conversation. Mm as we think of people, how they conceive of the internet and how it's supposed to help them with their own lives. And I think 
it's really it's really a clash between what can the internet do for me in my context versus um, a different sort of conception and that tends to be dominated by the US corporations that dominate our internet um, and they do that in, in so many different ways and, and when I talk about maybe some of the other aspects of colonialism um, I can indicate that the kinds of roles that they play in, in making sure that their um, narratives are front and center mm -hmm. um, but one other example of this that you can see is um, when we talk about founders of the internet, um, you can often find the same kinds of stories um, mm. that it was founded in the US Department of Defense, um, mm. which is a very, very important thing that we, we seem to sometimes not consider fully its implications, but that's important. But it's attributed to certain figures and, you know, Vince Cerf being a key figure. And then, so if you go on to the Internet Society, which is nowadays a very important um, internet governance organization, it will talk about the narrative of the internet being started and him being a forefather of the internet. Mm. You can then go to the website of the Web Foundation, um, which is an organization started by Tim Burton Lee. And on there, we, they, they really work to disengage the web from the internet, which often people don't do in popular parlance. Mm and um, talk about how he, he started the web. And so the, the reason why I bring these up is because you see, you see people kind of struggling over the historical narratives mm. uh, of how these technologies came about because they feel that that's going to give them um, some kind of power over how they should be today and how they should be in the future and the values that they should hold in the future. So you see internet society putting out its version of what the internet should be for the future based on this kind of historical uh, credence that it's given for him being a founder. And you see the web foundation saying, no, we need openness, we need open source, because that's the vision that he had for the web when mm. he founded it and he gave it to the world because of mm. course it wasn't proprietary he chose to, for it to be free i mean what's your take i'm really curious do you think it's important for us to to separate the internet from the web do you think that they have fundamentally different visions and ideas and ideologies um yeah how do you interact with with both of those concepts i think one of the key issues when we have conversations around technology is actually that we are too focused on the wires and cables, um, too mm. focused on the technologies um, and maybe not focused enough on the social situations that give mm. them rise and the aims of the people that created them. Um, it's Ruha Benjamin who writes a wonderful book mm. about race and technology um, that talks about how, uh, and other theorists have also done this, who talks about how technology is a sedimentation of people's existing views, biases, in this mm. case racism, um, and it should be seen in that light rather than as something that can be neutral or separated mm. in some way from society. So when you ask me about like the web and the internet and how they're different, um, yes they are different but it, it almost doesn't matter so much as what their intentions are between what we're trying to use them for now and how people conceive of them, which mm. in my mind is kind of more important at this point. Mm. Okay, I'm just gonna make a moment to give a quick shout out to if you have any questions, because already we're, we're only like 15 minutes in and my mind is buzzing. Um, so I'm sure if you're listening, you've also got, it's brought up a whole bunch of questions for you. So please drop them in the chat um, so we can have some time at the towards the end to ask Hannah. Um, I'm going to build on that because you've you've talked about how um, the focus sometimes overly is on the, the physical technology um, or the technology itself rather than kind of why it exists and what the technology then does. And if we kind of come back to your original idea of your original structuring of colonialism, which is economic expansion and subjugation of others and the ideology, if we then look at things like the economic the economic expansion um, and the subjugation of others. I wonder how you see those things play out. And, and the thing that I'm thinking of is, for example, the ways in which we think of, you know, a company like Facebook having, um, being a US Silicon Valley centered company, and yet they have, you know, moderators all over the world who are not paid very much. And they have this huge labor force that is completely invisibilized. So like, is that the kind of thing that you're also talking about? And, and I'd love to hear you, I'd love for you to expand on that because it might not be something that people are aware of. 
Yes, absolutely. That's 100% one of the things that I'm talking about. Um, this, that, I mean, going, very, going back to Marx, going back to Marxism, I'm thinking very carefully about how the labor between the products um, and, and the work that goes into it is made invisible. That's absolutely done writ large of the internet scale, right? You just, you don't, the wires and the cables have been taken away in some senses and you just, you know, you have an iPhone and it came from somewhere and someone, someone made it, but that, that's not so important. And actually, again, one of the things that brought me to this work was I used to run Media Diversified years ago, um, which was an organization that used to publish comment and analysis focusing on writers of color in the UK. And I, you know, we, we produced a lot of great content and it was published on our website and then it was publicized on social media and we used Twitter a lot. And I was thinking, you know, yes, is this democratizing the conversation around race and racism? To some extent, of course, it's opening up to lots of different people. Are the writers being paid for their labor? No, they're not. Are the creators on Twitter being paid for their labor? No, they're not. Who is benefiting economically from this work? Okay, right, it's still the same white men in Silicon Valley. And, and that bothered me. I was like, you know, I'm doing all this work and we're scrabbling absolute scraps to try and pay the writers. Mm. Um, but we're just not benefiting in, in any way. And it was that which brought me to think, okay, well, obviously the infrastructure, the creation, the way that the internet is structured, even though at that time, you know, this was around 2013, at that time there was so much enthusiasm. And since then, I think we've definitely become less enthusiastic and we've started to, 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 to draw the curtain a little bit on, on what these big tech companies are doing. But this idea that we're democratizing power it didn't seem right. Um, and when we think about it from an ec economic perspective, yes. So the iPhone that you have, you know, that's made in um, a Chinese factory, but we, we know that people have worked so hard that, you know, they're driven to suicide. Like this is terrible. And you might say that mm. this is a tool for racial liberation for one person, but we, we need to talk about um, racial liberation at a global scale, not a sub-global scale, because that will lead to further subjugation in other mm. parts of the world to serve us. So, I mean, that's really important and I'm glad you brought it up. And then, you know, other ways in which that happens, again, data moderation, like you say, in the Philippines is where it's often concentrated. Um, again, very underpaid labor. And actually the one exception to this, um, I think it was Safia Moja Noble who talks about it, is, in, and also it's quite well known, in, in Germany, um, they actually have decided that they need to have their content moderation in Germany. And it's like the only country that's managed to negotiate their, um, their exception to the rule, which is, you know, very interesting. And it goes to show that if you do pressure mm. these big tech mm. companies with some effort, they will respond to you if they feel like their market, you know, is being impacted and they have to respond to you. Um, so, you know, you can see economic exploitation there in the labor, you know, behind the scenes, but then also the whole narrative we have around data extraction. Mm. Um, that's extremely significant. You mm. know, you see um, people being offered terms and conditions all around the world um, to access services that are seemingly free. And obviously we, we are all quite well acquainted with the fact that our data is being harvested and used in lots of different ways. But um, I think the important point on this conversation um, is how that data is traded as fact when in fact it is a creation mm. it is a creation um from from a system so you know you might track my movements within facebook but facebook was structured by you and so therefore my actions on facebook are structured by you and yet you're going to use that as facts about who i am as a person rather than how i act on facebook and because our current like decision making and you know it's very quantifiable you can use very large data sets people give a lot of value to large data mm. sets and again this is the ideology of big data at work you know the ideology that if you have a lot of data points then that automatically means that you're working with fact um, so you know data extraction is another form uh, we can see of, of the economic extraction and there have been attempts by other parts of the world to also limit this and restrict this 
but it's, 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 it's incredibly difficult because at the same time you want to have access to the same resources that everyone else in the world has and, and you know the benefits that they have it's complicated like on the one hand you, you want to use the services on the other hand you know how do you protect yourself and, and I think in our conversations it's become so individualized that oh you need to make sure that you use an ethical platform or you need to make sure that you individually choose the right email platform but really the responsibility should it be on the individual i mean that is a, that is doesn't seem fair to me and then when you're talking about it in a, on a global scale with the global power dynamics at play you can see um these big tech corporations are capitalizing on the global internet access consensus that we talked about earlier. So um, it's a bit of an old example now, but back in 2016, Facebook was offering this service called Free mm. Basics. And it was um, a limited access to the internet through the Facebook app. Um, and Facebook chose a, a list of services that people could access through it, uh, but it was free. So it was zero rated and in your mobile phone contract, you were able to, um, you were able to do that. Now, this um, impinged this idea of net neutrality that everything mm. on the internet should have the same um, ability to be accessed at one time. Mm. And um, the Indian civil society and Indian government actually opposed free basics use in India after a kind of a big um, campaign um, by tech activists and all different kinds of activists in that country. Um, got pretty nasty, there were billboards up and uh, I think it was, it was a major newspaper that um, Mark Zuckerberg wrote an editorial in saying, you know, look, we're just trying to help the Indian people. Um, and you know there was there was so benevolent so benevolent <laughs> exactly and you know a lot of the uh, conversations around this are benevolent where um they're trying to offer internet in different ways you think of google's project loon or all these other different services that they're, they're looking to essentially build into new markets um mm. but it's coming with caveats mm. even when these uh, companies you know they talk about openness and access they're not even offering that much and so then you start to see this differentiated spaces where access for one group access for the global north means fast internet means access mm. to the whole internet means that you have the capacity to um create content and upload it because you have those kinds of connections but then you think of access for other parts of the world and then it's about consumption it's about buying things it's about not having access to rich content or being able to create content so it's differentiated in that way yeah, it's fascinating. The um, the free basics example, I think that you're talking about as well, had a huge impact in Myanmar, famously, because it, it sort of coincided with this time where, um, and people, again, might be aware of this, but where SIM cards became all of a sudden much, much cheaper. Um, Facebook was then providing, and you might know this more, Hannah, but um, it also then meant that, like, it created this, the, the conditions for the local, um, politics to play out online and then also for the platforms to distance themselves and obviously there's been a lot of pushback from Facebook uh, uh, a lot of pushback to force Facebook to do something about it but as you say they only do they only make any changes once it's the rubbers really hit the road and once they're forced to it's never a case of um of like oh we're gonna we're gonna do the quote unquote um ethical or just thing in this space and actually to pick up off uh, on one of the things or I mean there was a lot that you covered there that I think is really interesting but um, I'm curious then around like this double-edged the catch-22 really of you know you as, as the former editor as the editor of Media Diversified you're looking at okay we're going to be able to expose the the content or we're going to be able to you know share our content with lots of different people and we're going to be able to catalyze these conversations and i know lots of creators are in this double bind of being like well i can put my stuff out there for free because people are now used to to stuff being accessible for free um and that will help me you know build my brand and it's the classic thing of like exposure will be good for you in the long term um versus then how do we um how do we wean ourselves off that because because at the end of the day somebody is making money off our labor right it's not as if like nobody's making any money it's that somebody's making money. we're just not seeing it 
um, I mean, what, what do you think about that double bind? Because if, you know, I often think that like, I wouldn't have the platform that I do if it hadn't been for the social media quote unquote platforms, because I wouldn't have had the um, opportunity to share my thoughts and so on and so on. But at the same time, um, I understand that I was then complicit in participating in a setup that perhaps uh, was not was not the best. But again, it, the, you know, these are very individual choices, very micro choices that we're all being forced to make, right? Absolutely. And I totally understand it is so hard to make these decisions. Um, I used to use Twitter a lot. I don't use Twitter anymore um, because there's, a, you know, Twitter does not adequately deal with hate speech, harassment, mm. incitement to violence against women and people of color. It does not do that. It allows the breed, it's a breeding ground for fascism, like, and it continues to deny that this is an issue or, mm. or make in, in, inadequate attempts to change on this, right? And I wonder, like, I mean, this is not quite realistic, but I wonder whether if it was, if Twitter was created by person or had team members that were, you know, a significant amount of team members that were women or people of color or minoritized groups in any way, whether they would have had these early structural problems with the platform. It's, it's very unlikely because someone would have thought of it before, you know, it started to happen. Um, but it's difficult. How do you make these choices when most of the audiences or people that you're looking to speak to are already in these spaces? Mm. Um, and another area, you know, for me as a researcher is, do I use Google Scholar? Yes, I use Google Scholar. Mm -hmm. Has it got problems? It's got huge, huge problems in terms mm -hmm. of marginalizing the work of scholars from other parts of the world. Um, they don't come up in search. If it, and the, the, the way that the um, rankings are calculated are discriminatory. They're a problem. Uh, but, you know, in a time of COVID, when I can't get to a library, mm. what do people end up doing? You know, the, it's, we're always trying to navigate this. And I think for me, the solution is always at least to have a strong awareness and continue to uh, problematize our use mm. of these platforms. So yes, okay, you have to be on Twitter, but then you must criticize Twitter. You must mm continue to pressure change where it's required on those platforms okay you end up using google scholar but look for alternatives at the same time um, you need to have a, a website maybe you can make sure that you use something that's open source rather than something maybe you can look for some uh, a platform or um, a solution for your website building that doesn't involve these corporations and you can find an alternative i don't want to say that it has to be centered on the individual but a bit like the environmental movement, I think there mm. needs to be um, a critical mass at the individual level um, and an awareness and a problem and a problematization rather than um, feeling like, oh, this is kind of the ship has sailed and it's not something that we need to be concerned with. Because mm. at least if I just click agree and I can go through to, to my services, um, I, I can get by day to day. And mm. I think COVID has been a really difficult situation for this because a lot of us have been forced into using mm. solutions that we might not have otherwise used mm. um, because of the situation and um, I think a lot of people who work on human rights and the internet are very very concerned at the moment about that. Yeah I mean do you want to speak a bit more about that because I, I know that like from a personal perspective the racialized surveillance and something is and you know with all you know, um, the United States and here in the UK and where I grew up, Australia, sort of moving towards these test and trace apps and so on that have all sorts of like problematic things attached to them. Again, not necessarily on the web, but using connectivity, using the internet and so on. Um, and the conversation around them actually being really fractured, I think, and, and fractious in lots of different ways. I mean, how have you engaged in, in the, the, the move online during this period? Yeah, I mean, you bring up such an important conversation. And so at the moment, actually, I should have said it at the start, at the moment, the Internet Governance Forum is actually taking place online. Um, that conference that's run by the UN um, to bring together stakeholders um, talking about Internet governance. And this year, the conferences that I've observed that have taken place online have talked a lot around um, the pandemic and the implications mm. that it's had, um, especially these um, kind of test and trace apps and technological solutions to effectively, I would say, social mm. problems. Mm. Mm. Um, and I, again, I'll go back to Ruha Benjamin's book. Um, 
she uses this example, uh, which I think is great, of a soap dispenser, um, which it's supposed to be recognizing, like if her, if her hand's under it, it, it produces soap. And she mentions how it works something to do with uh, releasing some light. And a darker skinned person and a light skinned person used it, and it worked for the light skinned person and not for the dark skinned person because the technology didn't um, recognize their skin tone. Now, she uses this example to great effect, I think, because it shows you some of the inherent biases that can exist in technologies. Now, that's a very simple, low tech example. But if those, if you, I mean, if you think about the number of decisions and the amount of coding that goes into producing um, other technologies, there will be constantly decisions being made mm. at that kind of level that will, you know, obviously escalate as you increase mm. the size of mm. whatever it is. So that's definitely one aspect. There's bias in design. Uh, there's racism in design, let's say. Um, so that's one issue. And then related to that, you know, we're collecting data on a huge scale. People's, you know, personal data for the purposes of these health devices and then if you start to then look at that i mean i think we all recognize the issue at a domestic level but look at that at a more global level you end up with corporations housed in the global north holding information about people living in the global south mm. about their gender identity or related to their ethnicity um, and we do know mm. that there are leaks of these kinds of information and mm. it could be life-threatening in certain situations mm. where governments are hostile to a particular ethnic group, a particular sexual orientation, a particular gender identity um, and that is not thought about enough. Mm. Yeah and I think like speaking of societies that we term in the global south and I'm curious whether you know of what the thinking is in communities that are um, perhaps on the continent, on the African continent, in um, in Southeast Asia or in Latin America, like are there different conversations about what it means to engage with the internet and are there different ideas coming out of these spaces? I mean, I have no idea, but I'm quite curious whether you've come across in your research. Yeah, absolutely. So for my research, um, I've been following specific kind of activist groups and, mm. and three that um, really interested me because they had quite different approaches and different groups that they worked for and um, mm. the first group is kind of a loosely affiliated network of indigenous rights activists um, that attend these conferences and, and mm. some of their concerns are very very interesting because on the one hand there's a situation where to access government services there's a necessity to be connected to the internet mm. And, you know, this is very significant. Mm. For example, particular indigenous community that I visited in India, um, they had been forcibly removed from their homes um, in, the, in the forested areas by the government many, maybe two decades ago. And they could no longer live in the way that they used to on, on, the, um, on the land effectively. And they, they now don't have those resources. And so the government has mm. constantly tried to plug them into government services but these people also um, mm. don't have significant access to the internet, so they can't access the services either. Mm. So there's a sort of push and pull. Um, there's a concern around using mm. these tools um, that, you know, from, from a hostile, you know, government that has, has turned these people's lives upside down. Uh, and mm. at the same time, there's, you know, living day to day, uh, there's accessing health services, there's huge rates of alcoholism, uh, huge rates of child pregnancy, these people need access to health care, um, you know, and if they can't, they need access to funds, they need access to food, they're not allowed to pick food from the natural environment where they've been forcibly removed from. So um, that push and bull is definitely a concern. And then in another context, again, from the indigenous communities, um, there's issues around language. So Google Translate wants to add these indigenous languages to its services and you know mm. understandably you know there's huge concern around this in the past where um, mm. knowledge has been taken and codified from these groups it's been to um, to harm them it's been to control them it's been to it's been such a game. yeah yeah absolutely and so again mm. it's push and pull because you know it's 
what's being held to them is, look, this is a way to keep your language alive. This is the only way to keep your language alive. And at the same time, people are thinking, mm. no, this is the way, this is how you're going to kill our language. And then you see a generational difference as well, because you see people who are elders in these communities who do feel that technology is absolutely, in not all cases, but in some cases in the experience that I've had, who are very, don't want to use it because they've seen what's happened in the past with other forms of technology mm. that have been harmful. And then you have younger people who are very um, au fait with using digital technologies and who want to try and, and use them in their own context. Mm. And I don't want it to seem like there's no mm. uh, halfway because there is, because you do see um, the, the rise of community networks in a lot of these spaces, which are, um, local area networks focused on the needs of the community ad administered by the community and not necessarily connected to the internet um and maybe i wonder whether that is some way to kind of have some mm, that's really interesting so where is that happening that's fascinating because I, I suppose the, the next question i was going to ask you was like is what what are the alternatives that communities are starting to like for example um uh, it, it almost sounds like a version of a co-op or a mutual aid kind of group, but within within an online space. Is that the kind of way that people are thinking about things? Yes, absolutely. Again, I would say it's social group needs to happen first. The technology part mm. is kind of the easy part. It's about how will we how will we administer this? Who will have the ability to maintain this once it's been set up? How will we um, put content into this system? Mm. Um, it's, it's creating a social system that will maintain it that can be difficult and challenging. But these um, community networks, they kind of have really exploded in, in interest and popularity over the last eight years or so. And you now see them in lots of rural communities where they have um, patchy access to the wider mm. internet. And that's in Europe. Uh, as well as Global South locations in, in lots of different regions. Um, and they've had kind of, I would say, varying levels of success, uh, with one of the mm. key issues being um, existing societal um, issues can make it difficult to maintain them. As I mean, once again, we go back to this idea that technology mm. isn't a panacea. You can't just throw a computer at something and expect everything to be sorted out. Mm. Like, there are, there are issues. I mean, if you've got no electricity, then having access to the internet is useless. So, yeah. let's put it quite bluntly. Yeah, yeah. It um, it always fascinates me how, you know, both people who work in technology and people outside technology have this sense that, um, technology is like magic. Like it performs things that are beyond our comprehension, rather than people seeing it as as something that is deliberately designed, follows a set of instructions, um, is fairly predictable and uh, and is a reflection of, of the folks and of the world that it was designed in. It's not somehow, it's, and that tech utopianism, I think, is, is so fascinating. Even, I remember um, I was talking to someone recently who, it was very well aware that like this, this piece of code that he'd written was not going to be able to like, um, fix a particular like it was a translation thing it was not going to be able to translate this particular text because um they didn't have the text uh, they didn't have the language but then the program spat something out and he was like oh well it must have worked and it's like well well actually no it didn't work but just because it spat something out now you've assumed that it does work because you think that something magic happens and it's now works right and i, I just i don't know i, I mean is that part of the idea of that take utopianism? Is that part of the ideology of the internet as well? Or is that like something that's actually not really to do with the internet and more like how we think about technology broadly? And do we, and how does that then tie into how we think about resisting, um, you know, the, the ubiquity of these ideas? Yeah, yeah, tech utopianism, dystopianism as well. I would say, you know, they're mm. almost similar. They're in, similar in a sense because they don't require qualification. It's kind of just like your brain mm. goes from one thing and it's just to the other and there's a black box in the middle. And I think the, the discourse that we've had around algorithms really helps to show some of uh, the concerns that are beginning to emerge around this, but didn't exist before. Before it was kind of like, well, it works, so just do it and, and whatever. Um, and it, it's taken us to experience, um, you know, the, some of the negative effects. 
um, mm. of, you know, of leaks or, or finding out, you know, that there are whole organizations like Cambridge Analytica doing things mm. about data that we didn't think about. That's inside the back box, right? Um, Sophia Mojanova, who I mentioned earlier, wrote Algorithms of Oppression and, and talked about how the way she got started on that book was she searched for black girls uh, on Google and Google's autocomplete took it to porn. She did the same thing with the Latino girls. She did the same thing with Asian girls and Google automatically took it to porn. So you can see from that, that the kind of within the black box, there are all kinds of things happening um, that we don't pay attention to. And so to think of Google, well, it's a very, say it's a very effective search. Say that's how we think of it. You know, it's very effective. That's why I use it. I don't use DuckDuckGo because, you know, it doesn't bring up relevant results. I just need something that's quick. Uh, by the way, I do try and use DuckDuckGo. I mean, that's literally the, the, the train of thought that exists in my head all the time. DuckDuckGo is my, like, um, my default search engine. And sometimes I'm like, what are you, what, where are you taking me, DuckDuckGo? Like, why? This is DuckDuck <laughs> Stop. Like, what? Um, sorry, I love DuckDuckGo. It's great. Um, yeah. But <laughs> so I interrupted your thoughts. Sorry. No, no, that's completely fine. I, I feel the same about DuckDuckGo. It's, it's one of those difficult relationships. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, what we're getting at is, I do think it's a part of the ideology of technology more broadly, like you say. Mm. Um, I think we often struggle with this idea of technological determinism, that technology is somehow separate from society, and that mm. it can either be absolutely awful and it will lead to the end of the world or that it will be wonderful and amazing and you just have to wave the technological wand at something and i think that that view i mean it's very easy to challenge it when you talk about it and it seems a bit ridiculous to have that view right but in our conversation but technological determinism inflects all of our conversations about technology and internet access when we're thinking about global internet access, when we're thinking about universal internet access, which is where I started this conversation, we're not asking about what that internet access looks like. We're just saying you need some kind of access. And if that, if you need an example of technological determinism, that's it, you know, access to what, uh, what kind of access, like, what will you be able to do with that access? How yeah. far will it Why will it be better if you, yeah. What can you achieve with it? Mm. So interesting. I'd never actually personally questioned the need for internet access because I had always, you know, similarly made the assumption, well, surely if we have access, if everyone has access, that's, that's an equalizer, but, but that access, you know, but access doesn't actually mean anything specific. It's about getting into the nitty gritty. We've actually had some really great questions come through. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to ask you one more question, Hannah, and then start to go to the questions that are coming in. And if you have, please continue to add questions in the Q&A. Um, how, how do we, is there a way that we can decolonize the internet? Like, is there a way that we can decolonize our relationship to the internet? What does it look like? Is it, a, yeah, I'd love to hear your, your take. There are lots of amazing activists doing wonderful, wonderful things. And, um, after this, I will share the names of the people that I've mentioned. I saw someone talk about that and also some of the, the wonderful activists. Um, to, so we talked about, you know, the different dimensions of colonialism as it plays out on the internet. And, and I talked about, you know, subjugation and then classification. And I think one of the key areas that happens is in the knowledge that we see mm. on the internet. Um, so we know that there's a problem with Wikipedia for, for many years, that the, the majority of um, Wikipedia entries are written by white men in the global mm. north mm. and there have been people who work for the Wikimedia foundation and other activists that have started to challenge that and i think mm. i bring that up because i think it's a very important example you know they have noticed that there are you know key figures who are women living in the global south who are just not represented at all and they have they have these hackathon parties where they get together and they produce the entries for these key figures so that the knowledge is there somewhere. Um, mm. I think those kind of interventions are very, very important because, you know, Wikipedia, like it or not, is a resource that huge variety of people around the world are using as their primary resource about information on the mm. internet. Um, mm. So we do need to intervene with some of the, the, the resources that are out there and make sure that we're doing something 
even as we look towards more systemic change, we also need mm. to make some more piecemeal changes with the systems that we already have. Mm. Thank you. So focusing on the big and the, the micro at the same time, which I think is, is really important. So I've got a question here from a Charlie. Thank you for covering this topic today, Charlie says. In light of resisting colonization of the internet, what is the ideological alternative to internet colonization? What values would it imbue? That's a really great question. Thank you. Um, so for, from my thinking, my thinking is very much informed by um, decolonial writers, so mainly um, located in Latin America. And the kind of work that I do is very much focused on firstly, showing the inequalities, showing the, um, the power asymmetries and the way that they work. That's, that's the first piece of work that needs to be done. Okay, because we need to kind of lift the veil on um, these ideologies. Like a lot of people don't feel the ideologies of the internet. They don't see them, they're not visible. They make themselves unclear. So that is an important piece of the work. And then the next part is to look at who has been pushed to the periphery, whose ways of existing and using technology have been pushed to the side and bringing those up into the light and seeing what they're doing. Um, through my research, I've noticed, and this will be popular knowledge to the people from living in different parts of the world, of course, so it's not like something that I've specifically found, but for me, it was interesting to notice the ways that technology is used in ways that you wouldn't expect in other parts of the world. So in places where there's load shedding, for example, where electricity is turned off for significant parts of the day, um, there are cultures around how to get around that. So while the, inter while the electricity is off, people find other ways to occupy themselves. And that might be like sitting around singing songs in the case of my family in Lahore, um, or it might be something else or um, in another place where I was doing field work, we're very used to having our mobile phones and they're very much one person, one phone, and you would never let anyone else touch your phone. No, never. Um, but you know, in these places, someone will download a movie to their phone and then it will get passed around and everyone will watch the movie. Completely different, not what you'd expect. And they're totally the other kind of use. And so if we're thinking about what is the alternative to, to coloniality um, on the internet and through technology, it's about embracing and giving light to these alternatives. At the same time, we must push back against the, the governments and the corporations that have this unchecked power as well. I mean, there's no getting around that. That has to happen. And that has to be done at all levels, like problematizing the platforms on the platforms themselves, putting pressure on them politically, taxing them, breaking them apart. One of the huge issues is, especially in the global south, is that talent and new ideas get mm. hoovered up by these big corporations. Mm. So if there is a local solution that would be, you know, in some way a rival to one of the big tech companies, they buy it yeah. before it can grow. They hire the key person with a salary they cannot refuse. So, you mm. know, they're just chopping off the grass before it gets anywhere. So global south governments, need to intervene and protect their local tech entrepreneurs and technologists to prevent that from happening. Otherwise, they're constantly just going to get hoovered into Silicon Valley. It's a brain drain of, the glo of a, a global scale, truly. And it's also just to kind of flag the, the Google antitrust stuff that's happening at the moment is really interesting because it'll, if there's, um, if we start to see precedents, I think for states to be like, well, actually, no, your size means it is almost impossible for people to compete. And we're going to have to, I think we need state intervention 100%. I'm going to, I've realized that we're almost running out of time and there's such great questions. Um, we have another question which asks, what is the ideal, what, how does the ideology of open source reconcile with um, colonization of the internet? Great question, thanks again. Um, so open source comes from its own kind of historical background. Um, again, it often, not always, but some like Mozilla, for example, these are corporations again that come from California and, and this is a slightly different um, cultural history. Um, but I think within those spaces, there's definitely more room for conversation and also a more of a commitment to a different type of liberation through technology uh, in that one, when we think of, say, Facebook or these other corporations, it's more about 
liberation through the freedom of the consumer. Mm. Um, you will have as much choice as you want. You can have whatever services you want. You can consume whichever content you want that we produce for you. We'll do the work for you. Um, whereas open source approaches the idea from a different perspective. It's like you will be furnished with the skills to achieve what you want to achieve. Um, and that's a different type of freedom, right? Because there you can build it from the ground up as long as you have the skills. I mean, that's a difficult, that's a big but especially in a in a situation where a lot of us have been de-skilled effectively by these platforms when i was younger you, you could get a myspace page and you could use a little bit of html and like change up your background and all gets a bit of music playing and all that kind of stuff but you can't intervene in that way with modern um social yeah. media platforms they're completely closed off to us mm -hmm. so we've all been de-skilled like the last couple of generations from having these abilities, but open source would really, really approach it from a different way. It still expects a lot of privilege. It still expects a lot of education, skill, equipment, but the idea is that you would have more opportunity to tailor something to your own needs. Hmm. So perhaps a step closer towards kind of where we, where we hope we sort of get to. Um, we have a question, thank you. We have a question from Terence who says, is there a risk of moderation colonialism where content, content moderators in one country apply their moral standards to content produced and consumed in another? I think that's a great point. And I think that that is a real danger as well. Um, and related to that, so Facebook has recently created something called the Oversight Board. Um, mm. It was in the news and it was basically some really, really well respected global technologists, lawyers, mm. activists. And the idea being that they would meet regularly and kind of look at key cases of moderation and provide kind of precedence for decision making. Mm. And, and like, I really respect a lot of the figures that are included in this. But the danger is that this becomes a co-option of their kind of names. Um, and mm. you know, Facebook is now saying, you know, we are doing something about this moderation issue. Mm. And look, mm. we've got people from this part, from this part of the world. And now I, I don't expect that a lot of these people will allow this to happen if it's the case and eventually they'll just pack it in and say this was nonsense because mm. you know they're great activists but if that is the case then effectively they're getting a free pass to carry on doing what they were doing before but now with some sort of legitimacy and i think that's what we really have to watch out for is um the, the platforms or these corporations that they they carry on what they were going to do anyway but they just kind mm. of do the minimum to make it seem legitimate um, and yes, in terms of moderation, where you end up with these situations where labor is being exploited from certain parts mm. of the world um, in order to moderate content from other parts of the world. And that is bound to have implications in how it's taken, how, mm. how the world is done. It's, I, don't, I was trying to think of an equivalent, but it's like the green, it's the, the technology greenwashing equivalent, right? Of, of being like, yeah, yeah, we've done the thing. Um, but not actually fundamentally changing. I mean, the Oversight Board is a fascinating example of how a company like Facebook is trying to deal with what is a big problem. Um, but, and what I also think is, is fascinating about it is Mark Zuckerberg kind of pushing for the state to regulate it more. Again, rather than as a way to offset responsibility, as a way to abdicate responsibility from doing, from taking, from doing the work that they need to. Um, so it'll be, I mean, I kind of feel like the Oversight Board is, set up to fail because of how big a job they've been asked to do but i similarly respect a lot of people on it so also wish them the best um somebody else has asked how does the does the great firewall of china offer an alternative vision of the colonization of the internet how do we compare oh how should we compare this with the west's co um, colonization of the internet that's a, that's a great point and it's really important to bring in iran china russia mm. these other uh, internets, if you will. When I went to the Internet Governance Conference last year, the, the conference I mentioned earlier, the UN one, um, the major headline was um, One Internet United, in Internet United. Um, mm. So the European leaders, this was uh, in Berlin, and the European leaders uh, in the last two years, it's been in France and in Germany have really sought to try to emphasize that the, the, the internet should be global and we should have one global internet and have tried to assert the role that they have within governing that, realizing that really after the NSA, they haven't been doing that enough. Mm. When we think about other 
areas of the world where different rules kind of apply, that is happening more and more. So China is definitely one example. And I would not say that that's free of colonial or coloniality at all. No, it's, it's, I mean, there's still power asymmetries mm. and within that country. There are plenty of colonialities at play, even if it's not Western coloniality that's significant in that mm. context. Um, and you will also see kind of fragmentation in how other countries are beginning to mm. dictate what should happen on the internet. And the big example of that is um, the increasing use of internet sh shutdowns and slowdowns in loads of different mm. parts of the world. Mm. India is really, really guilty of, of this. Mm. I think it's the biggest gov uh, like government that uh, is responsible for them, but also in many, many countries across the continent of Africa, internet mm. shutdowns and slowdowns are used by the government to control people at different times, be that uh, during exam times, during elections, all, all different types of, of periods. So I would say at the moment, looking at the way that the internet is fragmenting, are there, there aren't really solutions to the power imbalances, but I mean, I don't know whether we can expect that from technology. It's not that we're going to find an internet that's going to correct the power imbalances and mm. inequalities within society. The, the inequalities within society need to be rectified and then maybe technology will mm. come to reflect that. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm thinking of a research paper that I read recently um, that was looking at the post, you know, Arab Spring, love of Twitter revolution, blah, 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 of 2009 and so on, and reminding us that politics always comes first. And I think this like applies across the board to, to conversations around technology. It's the social and the political often always comes first and then whatever else reflects it. Um, we have a question actually from Arik, which says, what are your thoughts on the rise of the alt-right competitors to the social media giants such as Parler? Do you think competitors in this field are likely to change the internet for better or for worse? It's a really good question. Thanks, Arik. So I, it's the, to my mind, they serve a couple of different purposes. I think there's one thing to be said for illustrating that there can be alternatives um, and that they can be successful and play a role. Um, but obviously the content within these particular alternatives is not something that I would agree with or, or mm. want to see. Um, and I think if it opens space for more and more alternatives to come in that are being used and, you know, I have been trying to get, Mastodon like working for me for I, I can't tell you how long and I still can't <laughs> figure it out and I just just don't understand it. yeah I gave up <laughs> yeah, and, and I like every few months I'm like gotta get on Mastodon and I'm like I don't understand Mastodon at all <laughs> but what we do need is these viable alternatives mm -hmm. um and so I I would like to see more of them emerge and I would see like more of them to raise the challenge Mm, great, thank you. All right, we're going to try and squeeze in just a couple more. Somebody has asked, how important is digital literacy in preventing colonization online? Are there examples of successes? I think digital literacy is extremely important and 100% one of the, the key elements of making people safer from some of the colonial dynamics online. Um, but it comes with so many other forms of education. And, and mm. yes, in our context, um, in, in the West, where a lot of people are online and have access, um, it really involves teaching them more about how things work and how they can keep themselves safe at the personal level. But in other parts of the world, there's a lot more to be said, because also they're dealing with language issues in some, some parts of the world where, you know, terms and conditions are in English mm. or in a, in a, not in a local language. Mm. So I think there also needs to be, that needs to come alongside so many other forms of education at the same time. We can't, again, say, you know, this is how you use Facebook and then leave them to it. Like there has to be other work done alongside it. 100%. Oh gosh, we are out of time, but this has been so delightful. Thank you, everybody. I'm Yasmin and I'm Majid, and we've just spent an hour with the fantastic Hannah Zumrud, but who has talked to us about the concept of digital colonialism, who has, 
you know, really highlighted the ideology behind the internet that I think is often invisible to many of us and encouraged us to resist in the various ways that we can. So thank you so much, Hannah. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I don't know if Arita is going to pop by and say hello to everyone, um, but this has been part of the Web Roots Democracy Festival. There's a few more events, so check out Web Roots Democracy on um, Web Roots online on Twitter um, and check out the rest of the event. And there will be a recording available soon, inshallah. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining us.